Well, good morning. Take a look at all the people sitting on the aisle over here. They, we've stuck them in the corner, so good to see you guys. By the way, I'm more comfortable in the corner. That's the place I like to sit, so if you're, if you're over on the side, that's where I would be sitting if I was here today. Glad you guys are here. By the way, thank you to those who parked in the grass today. Apparently, we are out of spaces, and what is wrong with you guys? You keep coming to church. So one of the things we've talked about is, is looking at adding a service in January, to which Randy said, can we wait till January? I'm like, yes. Uh, and then I've had some people say, you don't need to add a service. Where are you going to sit them? I don't know. Where are you going to park them? But anyway, but I, if you are interested in helping, one of the things we're looking at is, uh, in order to add a service, we have to multiply the people that help. So that means... Uh, we need help in all the different areas, whether, and there's sign-up sheets, I think. Are there sign-up sheets out there, Mike? Mike always knows. There will be. At some point, there will be sign-up sheets. But, uh, but you can talk to, to Bob and Mary right there. Bob and Mary, raise your hand. Just go talk to them and say, help me, I want to help. Uh, they do our ushers and our greeters and all that stuff. You want to help in the praise team, they'll talk to you. If you uh, want to help in the children's ministry, uh, Danielle or Jill would be glad to talk to you. And uh, that's all I'm going to name so far. I'm sure the sound guys need help, but we're just going to work Randy to death is our goal. And, uh, and Carl, Carl, we're just going to work you to death. But anyway, but I'm so glad each of you are here. And um, Joshua's up there working hard. We've got some of our youth helping now. I love that. And uh, glad you're here. So you ever have to make a decision or do something in faith, and it's very hard as you step out in faith to do something? I decided to write down this morning uh, just some of the things, if you're going to walk in faith, this is not part of the sermon, this is extra, lanyap, because we're going to talk about faith, and I thought, you know, I, I, people who maybe haven't been Christians a long time, or if you've been a Christian, you may think you're weird because you experience some of the things I'm going to talk about when you try to step out in faith. Sometimes stepping out in faith means you join a small group and you've never done that. Sometimes stepping out in faith means you decide you're going to help with greeting. See, I got that in twice. Uh, and, and you've never done that. You, you're, going to, you're going to help uh, uh, serve next Saturday night at the fall festival. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it, it, all these, you're going to park in the grass. You know, whatever it is, you're going to walk in faith. Maybe for you, walking in faith is adopting a child. Maybe for you, walking in faith is going out of your way to volunteer somewhere to help kids with reading or bringing food to a food pantry or, or whatever it is. We have people who open up their homes and do Bible studies even for teenagers. We, amazing things. Um, uh, Ernie is passing on his gifts to teens, teaching them how to play guitar and all kind of stuff. And so, you know, there's all kinds of ways that you can step out in faith. And if you're like me, when you start to step out in faith, you get really excited. And so your initial step is like, Wow, God is going to do great things. And so I wrote down, first step, excited. And then that moves straight into the next step, which is not as fun. Fear and doubt. How in the world are we going to do this? How is this going to work out? Couldn't I have done something easier? And don't forget the old, nobody appreciates you. That always pops up. Whenever you help anybody, by the way, I don't care if you give them a jump start or anything, like they don't appreciate it. That's the enemy. So you go from excited to fear and doubt, and then you go, don't forget, frustration. Because nothing ever goes the way you thought it was. You thought, I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to help in this area, I'm going to do this area, we're going to step out in faith, and then you go, that's not what I thought it was going to be. And so you have to go through frustration, but in frustration... You then move on to endurance, which is, I'm going to keep going. Now, you can quit at that point. And if you quit at that point, that's not called the white walk of faith anymore. <laughs> that's called the walk of what I want to do, which I like that walk better. Can I be honest? The walk of what I like to do. Because what I like to do is eat, watch football, Netflix, and hang out. But God's never called me to any of those things. Uh, I keep looking in the Bible. I mean, rest is in there, but I haven't seen Netflix, poolside, refiners, jacuzzi, 
you know, instead of refiner for bacon. Yeah, I got that one. All right, so you move to frustration and then endurance. And during endurance, what happens is you have to tweak because you were excited at first with what God wanted you to do, but now you kind of have to tweak how you're going to deal with it. Maybe it wasn't exactly what you thought. Maybe you do need to mix in some times of rest because you're helping in an area. Maybe you need to back off or maybe you need to do a little more. By the way, the shuttle always used to use the most uh, fuel uh, those first few feet off the pad. Anytime you start something, those first few weeks, months are going to take the most energy to get it off the ground. Whether you start a new job or whether you go and volunteer in a new ministry, those first few weeks, even months, can be difficult. And so you work on endurance and then you tweak. And then the next one's also called endurance, but the next one's called endurance and trust. God, I trust that you're doing something. My story about the coin was one of those things because I kept setting up my camera every week and I remember thinking, Eric, you are the worst filmer in the world. This, who is going to watch an iPhone filmed badly from the fourth row where you could hear if anybody coughed or laughed or asked if they could go to the bathroom of their mom, you could hear that in Afghanistan and yet it made a difference in somebody's life. And so what do you do? You endure and then you start to have faith. God, I know this is what you call me to do. So I'm just going to keep going. I don't feel like going right now. I don't f By the way, I've never had a step of faith where I said, I want to keep doing this. And, and I'll be honest with you. If you could, it's a good thing that you don't have insight into my mind on Mondays when I've almost quit like 500 times. Because I thought... I'm done. I'm done. Why do I want to do I could do something else. I was good at teaching school. You can ask Danielle. She'll tell you I was good at teaching school. I could do that. And then God reminds me. But that's not what I called you to. So you'll be miserable. <laughs> Endurance and trust. And then here's the best thing. After you go through all those emotions and all those things. You know what starts to happen? You start to get blessings. You start to see the fruit of what God's doing. Now, I wish that when you were going to step out in faith, that God would like do like the movies where you could get like a flash forward. Like this is what it's going to look like. This is the God never tells you. And, and what happens is when you start doing something where you step out in faith, you literally become miserable at some point. And that's the point of faith. Because you're not doing it based on feelings. You're not doing it because you feel like doing it. You're not doing it because anybody appreciates it. You're not doing it because of some high you're getting from doing it. You're doing it because you're being faithful to what God wants you to do. That's why it's the walk of faith, not the walk of feelings. But over time, you see the blessings. Think of it like disciplining your kids. Remember when your kids were little? You always had that one time that you were at the store. My wife loves to remind me of this story. You're at the store and, and your kid grabs something off the shelf and starts screaming that they have to have it. And if you're a good parent, you take it away and put it back on the shelf. That is the most miserable day of your life. Especially if you're a mom, because the dad's probably going, no, no, just get it. It doesn't matter. But the truth is, we all know that if we give that child everything and provide them everything and spoil them, that one day they're going to be 12. Do you remember 12? And so what do we do? We put the toy back on the shelf and we go, you're not going to get it because the way you're acting, that's not how we behave. We drive out of the McDonald's drive through we leave the thing in the store, whatever that thing is. Why? Because we understand that in the future, it's for the good of the child. Many of you, many of me, there's only one of me, but you get it. Many of us are in the stage right now where we're having to endure something and we don't like it. And we're... I don't want this. And here's the point where you have to say, but God, what do you want me to do? Now, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes God will say, 
That's all I wanted. I only wanted you to get this far. But most of the time, God says, keep stepping out. Keep walking. Keep going forward. I can't imagine being Daniel. Have you read the book yet? If you get a chance, read it. Read it and think, if this was me, what would I be thinking as I'm dragged from my ritzy home, walking across the desert in chains, past giant lions that you can see in the Met in New York, by the way. Side note, love archaeology, right? You can see those, right? What am I thinking as I go in and they say, you can eat anything you want? Sounds good. And Daniel and his friends go, nay, nay. That's not what God wants us to do. And you think that's the only test. And then over and over, Daniel's tested. They're like, we're going to wipe out all the wise men unless they can tell me this dream. Uh, could you hang on a second? I think I can tell the king his dream. We have the lion's den story. We have the fiery furnace happening with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or as Steve calls them, Horshack and his friends. Google Horshack, guys. That's... <laughs> Google Horshack, John Travolta. That's all you need to Google. <laughs> they know who John Travolta is. So. It was before he was bald. Did you know he was bald? He's bald. Okay. Just making sure. You know, you look at all these stories and you think, how in the world? Why? Because Daniel, you ready for this? Daniel walked in faith. And if you walk in faith, it's not going to be easy. I would love to tell you, you name it and claim it. You just go through life and go, Jesus, everything's wonderful. And it is if you don't do anything. I'm telling you, if you, but, I, but let me give you a secret too. I know that sitting around and watching Netflix and sitting by the pool sounds great. You know what will happen if you do that? You'll get depressed. You know why? Because you're not fulfilling God's purpose for you. When you step out in faith, it is exciting and terrifying and frustrating and rewarding. And there's days it's depressing. Because you've poured your life into somebody's life and you realize that they don't care. But then there's days you pour your life into somebody's life and you realize that God is using that person and doing great things with them and how God used you to bring fruit. So as we look at this today, I want to talk about what we've learned and I want to mainly talk about this idea that even though we're scared, God walks with us in faith. This is what we've learned. When I was a little kid, you've heard me tell the story about my parents. I was probably three or four years old. They took me to the haunted house at Disney World. What a great start. First time I've ever been to Disney World. I was probably three or four. I still try to figure out. I asked my mom last night. She goes, I don't know about that. When my mom says about that, that means she has no idea either. By the way, I got lost that day. Five kids were together in Disney World. And I specifically remember standing outside the castle crying as a security guard came up and said, where are your parents? That's the story of a middle child right there. If you're a middle child, I just... <laughs> it's the only story you need. All the other kids are with the parents, and where are you? Lost in Disney World. My mom says, I don't remember that. That's because you weren't around for that story. <laughs> By the way, she's watching online today, so hey, Mom! <laughs> I have an amazing mom, by the way. So, she was here last night. So, we go to the haunted house. The room starts stretching. If you remember that part, I start screaming, which is always a good start. My dad picks me up. And I'm still screaming. And he says, hang on. I'm going to go step on that guy's toe. And he's going to let us out. And, of course, as a little kid, I went. <coughs> and so, my dad slowly went towards that creepy person that's over in the corner. Dressed all in black. And when he got over there, I just assumed he stepped on his toes because the door opened. And I went, woohoo! We're out of here. Now here's the truth about God. 
Too many of us don't recognize that God in our circumstance when we're frustrated and overwhelmed and we've had too much. He doesn't give you all the strength to handle everything, but he does pick you up and carry you sometimes. And some of you today need him to do that. And that's the walk of faith that I think Daniel had. And that's what we're going to look at today. So we're going to look at three things we learned from the book of Daniel very quickly today. Here we go. Number one, God is with us. And is empowering us. Daniel 1, 18 to 20, we talked about uh, uh, the guys, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel all said, let's not take the king's food. Let's eat the right way and see what happens. And here's what happens. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them. He found none equal to Daniel, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So, they entered the king's service. Now listen to this. In every matter of wisdom. And this word uh, in the original language means not only wisdom, but also skill. It means they knew how to do stuff. And then it continues, and understanding. This word for understanding is a word that I wish I was better at. It means discernment. It's basically the idea of being able to see through something. So, you know, that means you walk up to somebody and they go, yeah, hey, I got a car to sell you. And a discerning person goes, I don't think, I don't know. And, and, or maybe a discerning person goes, you know, I know they look not good, but that's a good deal. And so discernment means you're able to see through things. So it says, their, their wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and chanters in his whole kingdom. Now let me tell you something. If I was in Daniel's shoes, I would have still been saying, it was so much better in Jerusalem. It was so much better than this. I was dragged away from home. Imagine the things that Daniel saw as a child, as a teen, young teenager, dragged into exile. He could have easily focused on all those things, but you know what he focused on? What's next? God, I can't fix this in the past, but what do you want me to do now? This morning, some of you are focused on the past. You're focused on something that happened, somebody that hurt you. And listen, I want you to deal with it. I want you to let it go. I want you to, to, to appropriately deal with it. But I don't want you to make the rest of your life focusing on something that happened to you years ago. I want you to learn the lesson from it and let that lesson be part of your life to bless other people. But begin to say, God, what do you want now? What do you have for me now? What's next? God will use your story to be a blessing now, but don't continually look at your story and make your old story your life. Your life is now. So move forward and say, God, give me wisdom now. James 1.5 says it this way, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should think about things all night, worry and fret, get frustrated, have a heart attack, get gray hair, and yell at your family. Oh, wait, that's Eric 1.5. I'm sorry, I read from the wrong verse. But you've all done that, haven't you? Got worried about something, frustrated about something, tried to figure out, what am I going to do, 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 and you can't even say it that fast. And yet you found yourself up all night, worried, Freaked out. What's next? Daniel and his friends didn't know what was next. They could only deal with what they were dealing with today. Too many of us are so worried and detailed. We want details about the next that we can't enjoy the now. I honestly think that Daniel and his friends enjoyed the quiz time with the king. Because they knew God was in charge. And so here's what the verse actually says. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Who gives generously, and I love this, to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. You ever feel inadequate? You ever feel like you're not enough? That's what this verse is talking about. 
God's not in heaven going, Marcus, I'm not so sure I can give you wisdom, buddy. I mean, you might think, I might think that, but right? But God says, without finding fault. So it means that on that day that you have self-doubt, and you're really not sure, and, and you, maybe you feel like a failure. Maybe you feel like you don't deserve God's grace or His love. It says that He will give you wisdom without finding fault. Now, wisdom, remember, goes with skill and that idea of discernment. I love that. Because I don't know about you, I need discernment. As I go through this life, I sometimes... And by the way, can I, can I give you a secret? Sometimes you need to admit you don't know what you don't know. Somebody was asking me something about a medical thing this morning. Because <laughs> I'm an expert. Stayed at a Holiday Inn Express once. And I said, I don't know. This is what I think. Well, I don't know. And that's okay. You, you realize that we used to bleed people to get them better. That's where your barbershop pole came from. I mean, that wasn't that long ago. And we think now, we're so smart because I read it on the internet. -er. <laughs> By the way, that's what I say. I don't know what you say. That's what I say. One of the reasons sometimes that we don't get wisdom is because we don't want it. I hate for God to tell me what to do. I like to do what I want to do. I mean, if he shows up and tells me to do something different than I want to do, guess what? It's not Netflix. It's not sitting by the pool. It's not the football game. God's interrupted football games. How dare he? And so we have to listen to what God wants us to do. So if we want wisdom, we have to say, God, I'm willing to listen. What's next? What do you want me to do? How do I deal with this situation? Matthew 28, Jesus said this, As surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You know, the wisest thing you can know is to understand that even when you don't feel that God is with you, if you're a believer, He is with you. To recognize that on your darkest day, in your deepest moment, when the, everything, the light seems out, and you don't know what you're supposed to do to just say, God, I don't feel you. I don't sense your presence, but I know you're here by faith. That's wisdom. Number two, God is with us even in the fire. Has God ever been with you in a hard time? You ever had him carry some of your problems? I love old Irish stories because my family's Irish. So my family even had a few stories. I actually learned how to plant potatoes as a kid with my grandfather, who learned from his great-grandfather how to plant potatoes. Did you know that? That was fun. I had no idea what I was doing. I was five. What do you want? But I remember following with a bag. We planted the potatoes, drove back to Miami, drove back to North Carolina, gave us a bag, and we followed the thing as they plowed those potatoes back up. We put potatoes in a bag. I still remember that. There's an old Irish story about a farmer walking down the road, just got his big bag of potatoes, walking down the road, and an old man pulls up in a buggy, and he says to the old farmer, get in. The farmer says, oh, thank you so much, I was so tired. And he gets in the buggy, and he's holding the potatoes. They go a mile, and the old man thinks, I wonder why he's holding the potatoes. He goes, uh, hey, farmer, you can put those potatoes down. He goes, no, no, no. I figured you're carrying me. You don't need to carry my potatoes too. <laughs> now, that's exactly what we do to God. We can all look back and see a time that we know that God carried us through. But God, I'm worried about this potato thought. And God, I'm going to fix this potato thought. And I'm going to and we carry around our worries, our burdens, our frustrations, and we wonder why they're heavy. And God says, you can put them down now. I'm carrying you. Some of us need to take our burdens, like he says, and present them as requests to God. God, I present these to you. I'm tired of picking them up. I'm exhausted from carrying them around. I surrender 
all to you. Daniel 3, 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are getting ready to be thrown in the fire, and they say, God is going to save us. And then they say this, but even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty. We will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. See, they did not have genie faith. Genie faith says, God, you answer my wishes the way I want, and I'll listen to you. God, you do what I want you to do, and then I'll believe you. That's genie faith. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're going to obey God, even if he doesn't answer our prayer the way we want him to. By the way, I don't know about you, I like God to answer my prayers the way I want him to. I've never said, God, please don't answer this prayer. I'm thankful that he didn't answer some prayers. You ever look back and think, you see that person on Facebook that you dated in high school and you go, thank God, right? <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Somebody's going to watch this. <laughs> Can we delete that, Randy? It's too late, isn't it? It's already, it's already gone out over the airwaves. Daniel 3, 25 to 27, this is a little bit later. I don't know about you, but if I was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'd be like, God, save us from the fiery furnace. They're tying their hands. God, save us from the fiery furnace. They're leading them up the walkway to the top, which is how they put them in. As they're being thrown, and the guys who threw them die, they have to be thinking, God, save us from the fiery furnace. As they're falling, they have to be thinking, well, I guess even if he doesn't, I guess we're going to go to heaven real quick here. Ah! That's the land of the lost cry, by the way. Ah! You can Google that too. They fall into the flaming furnace and they had to be thinking, I thought God was going to save us. And then the next thing they know, the, the ropes are burned off and they are walking. How big is this furnace? They are walking around in the furnace. I don't know if they've set up chairs. I'm not sure what the deal. Are they playing golf? Is, 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 what's happening? But here's what's really neat. Listen to this. The, the king comes. He looks in and he says, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods, which also can be translated the son of God. Gosh, it seems like I've heard something about the son of God. Many scholars believe this is Jesus actually showed up to hang out with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And if they hadn't gone in the fire, they wouldn't have met Jesus. I love that thought. And then it continues. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and he shouted, which shows that he was still pretty far away. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. They must have been, like, bummed. Can you imagine? I mean, how do you step out of that? Like, oh, man, we were having such a good toasty. I mean, were they 72 degrees? How'd that work? So they step out of the fire. The satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes weren't scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Why? Because God protected them. Listen, you need God's protection today. Some of you on the way here had suicidal thoughts. Some of you on the way here to church were so discouraged you could hardly stand it. Some of you are contemplating divorce. Some of you are contemplating things that if you had a bubble in front of your head, your friends would go, you're not thinking that, are you? That's not true. Why would you think something like that? Listen to this verse. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Listen, Satan wants to destroy you, destroy your family, destroy your neighbors, destroy anything that matters. The evil we've seen in Israel is just a touch of what the enemy does and wants to do and he kills people every single day with their thoughts and so be careful that you don't let the enemy sit here and ask God 
God, I know that this battle I'm having isn't just with my mind. It's not just with my emotions. That may be part of it. It's not just chemical, although that could be part of it. The truth is, it is not only a physical battle, it is a spiritual battle. So Lord, would you, like you did for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, send your angels or send Jesus. But would you protect me even from my own thoughts? Because some of you today will be free when you begin to realize the battle you're in is not just mental. It may be mental. It's not just physical. It may be physical. But it's also spiritual. That's why you're so discouraged beyond what you should be. That's why you don't want to do anything. That's why you want to give up and stop. Because your battle is spiritual. So begin treating it like a spiritual battle. And treat not just the symptoms, but treat the cause. You need Jesus. He needs to give you power. Number three, we can trust God. Some of you grew up in just a minute homes. Every time you asked for something or asked for time with your parents or asked them to do something with you, they looked at you and said, in a minute. And then you'd come back and go, hey, do you want to go to the park? In a minute. Do you want to go for a bike ride? In a minute. You want to play? In a minute. And you realize after a while that in a minute meant never. And so you quit trusting your parents. And because of that, many of you feel like God's the same way. That God wants to help you, but in a minute. And when you don't get the answer you think you should have, and when things don't go the way you think they should, you just give up. Because you're so used to being disappointed because of parents who never took time out to spend time with you. And yet, God wants to spend time time with you. So Daniel's now like 80 years old. He's got to be tired of all these kings. He's under like king number five at this point. He's got to be looking at these dudes like, next. This guy makes a declaration that if you pray, you're going to the lion's den. And Daniel's like, well, lions it is. And so Daniel does what he always does, and he gets thrown in the lion's den. The king was upset because he got tricked. It was Darius. He wasn't the smartest axe in the drawer. He was a fry short of a happy meal. So he comes out in the morning. At the first light of dawn, the king got up. He hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, serve the living God. Has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? And I always love to think that Daniel paused at this point. Maybe he was relaxing on a lion. Maybe he named them by then. Come on, Buford. That's what I would... Oh, I'm hillbilly. Okay, sorry. Daniel answered, May the king live forever. How to win friends and influence people. My God sent his angel. He shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. And I love this. He's not even out of the lion's den yet. And he says, Nor... Have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty? He basically says, hey, what they accused me of wasn't true. The king was overjoyed. He gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. When Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. In Aramaic, this word trusted not only means trust, but it means to be sure. Are you sure that God loves you? The enemy wants you to doubt it. Are you sure he finds you worthy because of the blood of Jesus Christ? The enemy wants you to doubt. Wants you to think that you don't matter. That you're not good enough. That you're too messed up for God to love. That you've made too many mistakes. But that's not God. That's your enemy. You can be sure. You can trust that God absolutely loves you and cares for you. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, the reason that we know that God loves us is because he sent Jesus for us. Here's what it says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And what will happen? He'll make your paths straight. If you read in Revelation on the robe of Jesus is, are the words faithful and true. He could have put any words there. The truth is that God's faithful to us. And so we can trust him. 
Years ago, there was a guy named John Cavanaugh who went to see Mother Teresa. He went to her place where she took care of people who were dying. And basically, he wanted some clarity in his life to figure out what he was going to do next. And so, as he was there a few days, finally, Mother Teresa came over to him and said, Hey, uh, can I pray for you? And he said, Yes. And she said, What do you want me to pray? He said, I would like you to pray for clarity. And she looked at him and said, No. And he said, What? She said, you don't need clarity. He said, but you seem to have clarity all the time. She said, I have never had clarity. What I have always had is trust. So that I will pray for you, that you will trust God. Some of us are looking for the answers for what's next. And the truth is, we just need to trust God. Because you don't know what's next. And it's okay to just say, but God, you know. I know it's noon. I'm letting you out. (laughs) You can turn it off now. I answered you. (laughs) If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that alarm's for you. It's time to wake up. (laughs) So, yeah. So if you want to give your life to Christ today, I'll be here after the service, even with alarms going off, and I'd be glad to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. (laughs) All right, Grandma, time to get the alarm out of the purse. Uh, Anyway, sorry, that's my mom that does that. Um, When I get home, she'll go, I do not. (laughs) I know, I'm just kidding. See see what I get in trouble for, Dan? Dave's like, yeah, I've seen you do that. Also, I want to pray for you guys, those of you who are struggling. Maybe one of the things I said earlier is something you struggle with today. God knows it. I don't. So he's going to help you walk through it, okay? It's a battle. If you need prayer, I'll be here after the service. Let's pray. Father, thank you for each one that's here. I pray that you'd bless them. Lord, I I just can't imagine the faith that Daniel walked in, and yet he did. And Lord, I know through your Holy Spirit, you can help us to have even more faith than we have. So Lord, help us. Help us to know you. Help us to walk with your spirit in faith, to walk in power, to walk in your strength. Lord, I pray that we would learn what it means to trust you. Lord, even when we don't have clarity, even when we don't know what's next, that we could know that you're going to take care of us regardless. Father, I pray for that one today that needs to know you for eternity, that today they would surrender their lives to you. Lord, I pray for that one today who's struggling in a big battle with the enemy, with their thoughts, with negative thinking, Lord, and and even suicidal thinking, that Lord, today, this very day, that you would reveal to them that the battle is not theirs, the battle belongs to you, and that you will take care of them. So, Lord, do that today. Father, bless each one here. In Jesus' name, amen.